Welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the HJR Mining Guy over on X and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. Really appreciate you joining us here for another exciting interview today because uh, we have Eric Strand joining us. He's the founder of AUAG Funds, Gold Silver Funds out of Sweden. Really looking forward to this conversation. We had Eric last on uh, at uh, the end of June last year. So we have lots to discuss, lots to, lots of topics to chew through because the, the landscape has changed dramatically in the interim we've seen an all-time high in the gold price and uh, yeah. since he is the founder of a gold mining fund we got to talk gold mining stocks as well and uh, we got to talk about his allocations in the fund and uh, it, one one in particular i want to know about is how did he handle the new crest and newmon uh, merger and acquisition how did he handle it in the portfolio because we've discussed that at length here on the channel so i'm curious how he as a fund manager handled that now Eric, it is great to see you again, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy New Year to you, and uh, thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, really nice to be back. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. No, we have lots to catch up on, Eric, and uh, lots lots to discuss. Uh, as I said in the intro, our channel likes to discuss the macro to understand the micro, and uh, you're definitely one of the better guests to discuss this with because we can discuss the macro, and then we discuss the mining stocks and uh, some of the performance, margin developments, and things like that. Um, let, let's start at the top, Eric. Uh, one question I always like to ask at the beginning is, like, how do you rate the current state of the economy and uh, the financial markets, Eric? Well... Uh... I mean, it has been a game. It's it's the game of the Fed. I mean, they're talking so much, and uh, the market uh, thinks that the rates will come down much faster than the Fed is trying to say. So it's like this game is going on, and we see it uh, going this way, that way, uh, and of course that has effects on the gold price and silver price. This week it goes that way and that way. So I think it's a lot of talking. Uh, and not, I don't see many participations look, really look at what's going on and how much the debt is growing in the US, how, how much it costs to serve the debt. And of course, I don't believe uh, personally in a soft landing. That means they are lowering the rates because the inflation would come down. I think uh, the prices have been going up and are still going up, even if inflation is going down. So the prices are elevated uh, for all the inflation prices that we talk when we talk about inflation and because i think rates will come down because there will be so many troubles in the financial system and that's when they will really lower rates uh, so I, I have another view on it than uh, most uh, normal big banks maybe or anybody who's believing in, in a soft landing absolutely yeah no it's like uh, Jerome Powell was fairly clear and dovish uh, in his last uh, speech there in, in December. We mentioned, well, we're looking at three rate cuts in 2024. Uh, surprised me a little bit that he was as clear as he was. Um, the market took it and said, okay, he said three, let's make it six or seven even. And I think some predictions had even had eight rate cuts next year. But uh, at eight rate cuts, that must be a massive calamity, or not calamity, like a disaster in the markets, because that looks like a Gulf War recession that we've had, the dot-com bubble, similar scenarios. Do you see the similar scenario developing next year, Eric? Well, I, what is interesting that it's like everybody wants to see lower rates and we need lower rates uh, probably in the system. But uh, I mean, the reason for, for the lowering of the rates are different. Uh, as I said, the Fed, they think they will do it because uh, they have controlled the inflation rate. Uh, but I don't think that would be the reason in the end. So as we have seen in history, uh, there are no such things as soft landings, really. And uh, we are also seeing that uh, they normally lower rates much faster than they raise them. So, of course, the Fed, they, I mean, it, talk is cheap. So, of course, they want to say higher for longer or transitory. I mean, they want to use these words. Uh, sometimes you're surprised that the market really believe them. Uh, and that's what we have seen in, like, in the gold price, uh, when the market really believed in a, a, a pivot. Uh, the gold price was really flying, making new all-time highs. And, of course, then the Fed was out again saying, no, we will not him a headwind for gold so it's this uh, back and forth uh, but not really based in uh, what is happening in the world but more based on just on what they are saying from one point to another now i think inflation is an interesting topic and uh, one, one topic i picked up just reading the news the last few days here as well as inflation fears and uh, worries about uh, creeping up inflation again as well because we've seen higher inflation in the us higher inflation also in europe so uh, are we returning to higher inflation scenarios it's uh 
maybe even a potential rate hike back on the table? Uh, I I would rather say that they would have to give up on inflation. So they cannot uh, keep what they really want because, first of all, the prices are elevated. I mean, to get the prices back what we, where we had them two or three years ago or something uh, similar like that, they would have to have a really high, uh, I mean, interest rates to get there and uh, we won't get there. So the prices will stay high, even if the inflation rate is getting lower. But as you said, I think uh, what is really driving inflation are strong forces that we cannot really change. And that is, we have had uh, production prices uh, going down for 30, 40 years, moving labor to the Asia East. And uh, now we also see even the deglobalization and these are very strong forces. We also see a larger middle class in uh, India, China with more buying power. And of course, they would compete uh, on the same thing. So I think we will have inflation, but and we will have to live with inflation. And on the other hand, the system wants inflation because they want us to consume. I mean, is it like 70% of the GDP in the US is consumption? And if you don't have uh, inflation, you don't get the buyers to buy now. And that's what you want. You want them to buy now because uh, so, so inflation is really like, I don't want, I wouldn't say funny because it's really a terrible thing, but it's something they want. And sometimes they say they want to make it lower or it's their target uh, to have it at 2%. And uh, so I think it's just, a, a, I wouldn't say a game, but they talk a lot. Oh, absolutely. And uh, how, how do you figure out geopolitical ten uh, <laughs> geopolitical tensions into into all of that? Now we're looking at uh, you know the Red Sea being you know under under fire more or less. Uh, that that could cause some uh, some some concerns. The oil price is not really reflecting it just yet. It's fairly stable. But uh, how do you see that factoring in? Well, uh, I mean things are happening, and it's very unsecure. And you have to. That's why you get the deglobalization. You want to secure like mining uh, in critical metals, you have to mine them in Europe or in the US. That won't be uh, cheaper, uh, maybe safer, but it will become more expensive. So there are a lot of things that will uh, make uh, a case for strong or higher prices in the future. And uh, instability in the world is uh, very much such a thing. And we will see, I think we will see more of that. Uh, and. Uh, Terrifying, of course, to see how it, uh, what is happening and what can happen. I mean, it's like uh, also China, Taiwan. I mean, I hope nothing happens there. But if it is going to happen, uh, I mean, there is a good. Uh, now, when the U.S. is so preoccupied, I don't know if there would be a, a better timing for China to move. So I think that's a little bit uh, scary. That I know so much about that, but uh, just looking at the situation, uh, the risk is there that we will see more of uh, instability and uh, unfortunately wars. And the strange thing here is that we have wars, we actually, I mean, we destroy, I mean, people die and we destroy a lot of uh, buildings or whatever. And then, of course, they are rebuilt. And that was, we look like a GDP going up. Because I mean, you have you have to spend money to build things, but you have never built. I mean, you destroyed something, and then you build a new house. You never, you really didn't create something. And I think that's the problem that we don't have a good GDP growth. It's just like debt based. It doesn't really bring new roads or new houses or so on. It's like uh, for not so good things. Uh, and I think people have to start to measure good loans, bad loans, good debt, bad debt, or or good growth. Not just looking at the number and then make a, a Fed decision on whatever number, uh, but to see it more uh, holistic or what's really, really happening. Absolutely. Like, you know, where, where do you see some headwinds for the markets in 2024 there, Eric? Um, you, you, you mentioned, you know, the GD, GDP growth and that always brings me to thinking about AI as well and increase in productivity. Um, and, and then again, I mentioned earlier the dot com boom. Uh, I think I mentioned before re recording as well, like just talking about uh, uh, Fed, Fed cut or Fed rate cuts during that time as well. So, t talking about GDP growth, headwinds for 2024, like how does that all fit together? How do, how do you predict the market to develop there in 2024, Eric? I mean, it's, 
GDP growth is, is one thing. Uh, and of course, AI, I don't think that will really give us growth. I mean, it will uh, <laughs> make uh, make it easier for maybe some companies to have less people employed. And, and that's another problem. So, and we also see that things don't really get cheaper because we uh, have more high tech. I mean, the iPhone isn't cheaper today than it was before. So somehow we succeed to like consume the high tech. So uh, if you look at history, it never really got cheaper because maybe TVs got cheaper, but uh, then we are very good at finding new, new things and uh, we spend more money. So some companies, of course, if they don't need so many employees, uh, that will save some money. Uh, but that would be a problem for the state with unemployment uh, because we don't create more jobs. Uh, so I don't know. I don't think there's so much to win. Uh, it's very, for me, overhyped. It's very nice with the evolution. And um, for me, it's like, uh, I mean, we had the calculator. So it was really fast with numbers. And now we have the AI, like it's really fast with words and sentences. So it's, uh, it's new tech, but I don't think it will... Uh, grow us out of something really no one discussion i want to i don't want to take it down that rabbit hole but i had a guest on <laughs> discussed, uh, universal basic income um as, yeah. as a result of the ai revolution just so that social inequality is more or balanced right so just random uh, side note I, there. I, I, I'm, I'm i'm not in that camp yeah i i have a hard time with it personally as well so, so just uh i i work and uh, I want to see the benefits of that personally. So um, a couple more topics I want to talk about before we talk about the miners and uh, how they have developed is, is the bond market and the US dollar. Um, let, let, let's start with the bond market. Uh, we've seen a bit of a rally in bond prices and yields coming down, but that has reversed in recent weeks. Uh, surprisingly, at the beginning of the year, the trend completely reversed as well. We're back at roughly 4% for the 10 year. How do you see the bond market developing as well? Because it seems to be an interesting indicator, a contraindicator for uh, for the gold market. Well, it, it can be. And there is some, of course, some competition uh, from the bond market or money market. So, uh, and I, I think we mean with lower rates, uh, bonds can be an interesting uh, investment. But the trend is that we always go lower and lower in rates. And uh, I mean, we have been even zero. I think we will go back somewhere close to 1% again. Uh, and then it will not be so interesting to, to hold bonds. But for a while, it can be interesting, of course, uh, maybe the coming year. But I'm not the expert on the bond market, actually. I mean, it's, it's such a strong, strong, big market, or big market, at least. Uh, I, I'm more worried maybe about... Uh, the financing for, for companies that will have to pay higher rates and how they will do. And I'm really interested to see how that works out in the US. I mean, they have company debt ever, I, or I would say, and uh, that has always ended in some trouble. Absolutely. Now, we, we, I think last time we talked, uh, Eric, was about uh, just when the yield curve reinverted again, we've seen some positive real yields again. Um, being created, so where uh, the bond yields were higher than inflation, so and uh, we're we're in that real yield territory again, right around four percent. With uh, if you want to believe the actual inflation number that's being presented to us, around three point two or three point four percent or so. I think that that that's where it all starts. That number. <laughs> what is that number? Exactly. What do you factor in, and uh, do you believe that we've beaten inflation as well? Right. So. Um, I can't say that without smiling. It's, it's it's tough to keep a straight face talking about that inflation number that we've beat yeah. inflation as well. Yeah. So, um, what, one last thing, Eric, I want to talk about is the U.S. dollar because uh, you mentioned it in a recent update as well, giving a bit of an outlook uh, for for the U.S. dollar in 2024. Uh, let's let's break down the U.S. dollar. How how do you see the currency developing next year or this year actually? Well, uh, first of all, I, I must say, I mean, the U.S. dollar is still the reserve currency and the strongest uh, in in the room in one way. I mean. If you get uh, turbulence in the market, investors will always go for the dollar uh, instead of uh, smaller currencies. So it's still the biggest, largest one, uh, and it has some strength in there. But there are two things that will be a headwind for the dollar. And one is actually the de-dollarization in the world. I mean, it's still the mostly used dollar, but we see more and more countries trying to start to make trades with uh, without the dollar. And we see more and more political positioning 
against the dollar. So there has been a premium for the dollar being the world reserve currency. And I think that premium will come down. So there is a reason why the dollar should be, become softer. And then there is the reason that the dollar always goes up first as Fed is normally the, uh, the central bank that raises rates first. And then you have a strong period with a strong dollar. And now we are getting to the opposite side uh, where they're going to lower rates and probably the, the Fed will lead again. And that will create a, a headwind then for the dollar, make it softer. Uh, I think there are two, two reasons that uh, for a European investor, you, you have to think uh, in a little bit different way than you did uh, three years ago or two years ago. So, uh, and I think that's interesting especially for investing in miners for European investors, actually. No, that, that, that's a very good point. Hold on, I've got to come back here on the screen. Um, th that, that's a very good point, because uh, one, one thing you mentioned is the FX advantage being, for us being in Europe. Uh, how, how do you factor that in? Like, how, how does that, uh, explain that to us, break that down a little bit. What's the uh, advantage? Yeah, uh, I, I, like, I would like to try to do that in an easy way. Uh, but. Sometimes, I mean, we have investments in, in gold with the ETF or ETC in Europe, uh, or you have the miners. And of course, there has been a competition that we didn't see 20 years ago. I mean, all gold investments were in miners. And then the last 10 years, uh, some money have left the miners for pure gold ETFs or ETCs investments. And uh, but what, what happens here is that this uh, leverage that normally miners have for the gold price happens before the FX effect. And my simple or easy example is if we will get a 20% return on gold this year, uh, and we have a two times leverage for miners, that would get us 40%. I mean, it's an example for mathematics. Uh, so that's it. But then if the dollar loses 10% via the euro or pound or whatever, the net effect for European investor in gold would be 10%. But the net effect for the mining investment would be 40 minus 10%, 30%. And suddenly you have the uh, relation 10 to 30 for the European investor. But in the US, it's still 20 and 40, 2 to 1. So for European investor, it gets more interesting to miners this period when the rates are going down and the dollar will be softer it's the so-called double whammy to quote anchorman so yeah, uh, it's, yeah. it's i mean it's against the miners in 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 a rate hike cycle compared to gold and but it, it will become an advantage to be invested in miners instead of the commodity absolutely um before we talk miners quickly i want to talk on the gold price um so we can have a you know solid foundation to discuss the miners um at the end of the year we've seen a new we've seen the gold price spike tremendously we, we touched on twenty one hundred dollars a new all-time high didn't see a lot of follow-through in the in the buying unfortunately everybody expected a bit of a rally uh come you know breaking through that ceiling it hasn't happened um let, let's discuss that real quick eric like you know what 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 pushed the gold price higher at first and then of course why did why didn't we see a follow through well i mean the, the market really believes now in in the the pivot and of course that will make gold higher, especially when it really starts and <laughs> we really want to believe it everybody wants to believe it now of course there was some sort of short squeeze and we got this very very uh, high spike there overnight uh, then it came back because I think the Fed was really fast out saying that uh, the market misunderstood their that they were not going to lower rates that fast. Uh, but I, I, I'm also happy that it seems like now 2000 is not the question anymore. I mean, we have stayed over 2000 for a long time, very stable. So not really coming I mean, because we had this period that we were over 2000 and then down again and then over and then down. And uh, we have actually stayed over 2000 for a long time and for me i think 2100 if we can stay there over a time then we really get the speed up and we will uh, never look back again absolutely what, what are the most uh, important factors influencing the gold price right now because just over the weekend unfortunately we've seen a bit of a spike in the gold price again due to the geopolitical tensions uh in in yemen the us bombing houthi positions uh gave a bit of a spark to the gold price uh, how sustainable is that I'd say they, these uh, spikes are never sustainable because they always come down again so so it, it's uh, short-term protection in a portfolio yes for the total portfolio but uh, i mean 
can come back to where they were. So that doesn't really help uh, gold prices in the long run. I mean, gold prices are uh, a mirror of the money creation and debt creation in the financial system. And that's a long-term trend that I probably won't uh, disappear uh, during our lives uh, because they just create more debt and more money. Uh, we see the debt in the US just such big deficits so there are so many strong fun fundamentals for gold and especially uh, when we get a, a softer dollar uh, making gold cheaper for investors uh, i think we get a lot of buying buying power there and uh, that would take the price up and of course we in our have a very low sentiment in the market for gold or gold miners uh, and when that changes I mean, you open all the gates. Let, People start to hunt the price, and I think that will come later because we have been uh, in a depressed market in some ways. So, so it will take time, and of course, that's good for an, any investor that want to accumulate. It's an opportunity. I think we are like it, this is an opportunity situation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely no, and I was going to ask you this, sort of the follow up question here based on the performance of the gold price, like not just your fund, but like how have the miners developed? Let's let's talk about the performance a little bit because uh, talk about a time lag. <laughs> we haven't seen much performance development. Uh, let, let, let's talk about that a bit. Like of course the share price has bumped, jumped, jumped a little bit, but even it, it wasn't even called it. I wouldn't even call it a, a jump. Maybe skipped a little bit. I don't I don't know how to say it. Um, maybe you could break that down for us. Like how did the miners react to everything? I'm a little bit, uh, of course, surprised in one way, but I think the sentiment is, is really, really low. Uh, what is interesting me more is like, uh, is there anybody left who wants to sell any, who is selling in the market? <laughs> I don't understand who is selling because, I mean, it, it looks like it's almost stupid to sell in the market. Uh, and of course, for every buyer, there must be a seller or the opposite. So it's very interesting who is the, who is buying and who is selling. Uh, so I really think we're getting into strong hands, and I think that's very, very good for the future. That uh, more and more gold and gold miner. No, ab ab absolutely, Eric. Um, one uh, trend. Uh, oh, oh go, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I think you. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, as you said, it, it's a big, big, big lag, and I think there's a misconception that uh, the market maybe have not understand that the miners have changed their behavior. I mean, in 2000 or so on, we had the hedging. That was such a big mistake for the big companies. They don't do that again. Then you have uh, on the 2011 all-time high, they were doing a lot of exploration, spending a lot of money in not such a good ways. Uh, they created more or took on more debt and so on. Not very good. But all this has changed. I mean, the miners have become so more, uh, much more share owner friendly. I mean, they have lowered the debt. I mean, all other sectors have have taken on more debt and the miners have lowered their debt. Uh, and we have a very stable gold price, even if it goes up and down a little bit, but it is it's very stable and high. Costs have gone up for the miners with the energy and so on, but that has been coming down, I would say, the energy prices. So uh, they're starting to pay dividends, they do buybacks, and they don't do it buybacks in the wrong way, like uh, a lot of, uh, other companies have done on the top of uh, share prices, but with on lower prices and without creating more debt. It's a totally different world uh, today, uh, but I think the market hasn't really seen that or not really interested because you can get money just investing in any. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, I think one big topic was always margin compression. Um, for, for the miners, you mentioned it costs crept up. So everybody started selling off the miners when they saw margins start to shrink. Um, that was especially in the early phase of the run up to $2,000. The question is now, how, how have the margins developed in, uh, in recent quarters? Personally, I don't follow the big miners too closely. Of course, I, th I take a glance at the numbers of the barracks and the Newmonts, but uh, I don't track it. So I'm curious, uh, uh, how have the margins developed in, in, in recent quarters? I mean, that it looks really, really strong just because of this stable price uh, it's not going up and down so much. I think uh, they have very strong cash flows, but I don't think the market is really, really interested or they don't see maybe the higher uh, gold price. I don't see the, the costs going up for them. 
So I think they will have fantastic results coming uh, over the years. The problem I may see in the market for miners is the jurisdiction. That's that's the, where I worry. Uh, mostly political and jurisdiction questions. Uh, cash flows, money, profits, buybacks, uh, take m as Everything looks really, really good. Uh, debt situation. Everything looks really, really good for me. But uh, political and jurisdictional questions, that's uh, that's where I worry. Well, since, since you brought that up, a uh, f- quick follow-up question there, Eric. What, what jurisdictions do worry you? Um, we've recently seen uh, some political turmoil in, in Ecuador, for example, just before the weekend. So I'm curious, uh, uh, what, what's, uh, what, what kind of jurisdiction is iffy for you? Well, for us, I mean, uh, we, since we started 2019, jurisdiction has been very high on our list. Uh, in the beginning, we said we don't invest in uh, Chinese Chinese companies. I mean, mining in China with the Chinese um, management or ownership or very difficult countries in Africa. And we decided at that time not to invest in Russian companies uh, because it was like a, a one-man show. Uh, and there was some good decision to make 2019. Uh, and we don't want uh, car- countries with too low uh, transparency indexes because that shows that uh, it's a state that is very uh, well. How something can happen because uh, when you run a fund, you don't want to have this binary risk that something really, really happens, like a coup or something. Uh, unfortunately, this question has become much uh, larger now because uh, we see problems in, well, let's say South America, Mexico. We have seen more and more things happening in these questions, and uh, sometimes they are hard to understand. Sometimes the state wants to make something, but it looks bad from the beginning. But in the end, maybe it's not that bad for for our companies because it gets more regulated, or they get more deals uh, from that. So. Uh, I think the computers, they see the news of something and they sell the stocks short or whatever. And then when you read a little bit more about it and understand it, it's maybe not that bad as it looked on the first line in the news. So a lot of misunderstandings, but still things are happening. And uh, it's very important that the miners are good at handling the situations. Uh, I mean, we had the Panama situation. We see more situations and it, it's... Uh, it was very important for us 2019 to set our baselines for, for jurisdiction, uh, but it's becoming more and more uh, important, and it's uh, it's a hard one to really where do you draw the line? Uh, absolutely, because Ecuador, Peru, Chile are really favorable money jurisdictions on paper, but then we see things happening like in Ecuador over the weekend, and and you just wonder is this where I want to put my money? Right. So yeah, it's a good, it's a good questions and important questions to handle. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about consolidation. Um, you you mentioned that the, that the companies are set up for it now. Uh, balance sheets are clean, and we've seen quite a bit of consolidation uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, the biggest one, obviously, was New, Newmont buying Newcrest uh, for roughly twenty billion dollars. Uh, I think it was nineteen point two or so. Don't quote me on the exact number. Um, but but how do you how do you see consolidation developing in the sector now, uh, especially in twenty twenty four going forward? I think it's a, a for as an investor, it, it's a good sign that it's happening. And uh, I would say not unfortunate, but I think we have very often been on both sides. So we haven't got the premium really. Uh, I mean, you want to own a company that is bought, but uh, you get that premium. Uh, but we see it and we see more. And I think that's uh, the reason behind it is that they have strong uh, cash flow, they have uh, good economics, low debt, and they don't want to start new exploration. And they don't want to do the unsafe things, so they rather buy buy another, maybe a little bit smaller or still rather large uh, peer in the group. So I think that will continue. Uh, sometimes I like it because we get a premium if uh, if our holding is bought by another somebody else. But I don't really like when the universe gets too small either. So so it's like I I have sometimes it's good, sometimes uh, I'm not so happy to see that we get fewer and fewer miners to choose from so it's, it's like Absolutely. i have both sides <laughs> i get it especially in the silver space it's quite cramped there there is not a lot of opportunity there in the silver space i i think yeah and the gold space and i think uh, i mean in the in the silver when when the silver price is uh, the gold to silver ratio is so high and and uh, we have to see that come down from 
anything like 85, you have to sit down come 70. And then I think uh, it gets really, really interesting because if we get a 20% gold return this year, I think it's very uh, realistic in dollars. Uh, and then we get the gold to silver ratio go from 85 to 70. Uh, we would see a zero price on 35. And that would be a 48% return. And then it would become more interesting to, to see how these miners, how much, I mean, when you see how much silver do they mine, it's on revenue. And, and when the go to silver ratio is very high, I mean, it doesn't look uh, like they mine so much silver because uh, the revenue is not so high because the price is so low on silver. Uh, so when the prices uh, come up in silver and starts to really go, I think, I mean, the revenue from silver uh, will be higher as a percentage of these companies and it will get more interesting, of course, for them to try to mine more, find more silver. But, uh, and I think silver will be really explosive. Uh, so since we're on the topic of silver, Eric, a, a question that can be quite controversial. Do, do you see silver as a precious metal still or more of an industrial metal? I think it's a unique matter that it's both. I mean, it's the one that is both. And I think that's a very uh, strong for an investor because uh, when you get a, a physical shortage for the industry and you use silver in like everything, every camera, every computer, every car, sun cells, everywhere you need silver, uh, but it's so little silver. So the price is inelastic. So the car companies, they, they will buy the silver for whatever price because it will not change the price of the end product. So for them, it doesn't really matter if the price is 25 or 100, it doesn't really change and they need it for the car. Uh, and it's only 40 grams or 50 grams in the car, but they need it. Uh, and we get this physical shortage and we're really looking that there are no reserves anymore that can be bought that is not owned by other investors and they will not sell now. Uh, and when we have had this managed price to too low price, you actually create this situation because uh, no one ha nobody has the real incentives to to try to mine uh, enough silver. So I think something big will happen in silver. I've been thinking that for a long time, of course, but uh, I mean, it gets closer by every day. Uh, that's a mathematical fact. And uh, if you look at the numbers, how, how tight it is, how they have to ship silver in and out just to make it work. Uh, and when the rumors get that, that we have not not premiums on retail buying silver coins, I mean, that solves itself by these premiums, but in the industry, uh, never happening in gold. And of course, on the other side, if you have copper, it's only industrial. So I think silver is, is, uh, is the perfect uh, the perfect metal fantastic um eric one thing like i wanted to talk to you about like we talked about newman and newcrest and i want to circle back to that real quick because i've been talking about it in presentations and other interviews as well personally where i was like okay if a fund manager owns let's say five percent in, in his portfolio of newman and five percent of newcrest and we see that mega merger happen i think you 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 weighted them at four percent each i think in in the past so let's assume you you go to eight percent of the new newman how do you deal with that situation and how does that play out? My, my question hints sort of at the, the flow of funds. Where is the money flowing afterwards and how did you handle that situation, Eric? Well, it's a bit different. I mean, we have one ETF, the gold mining ETF, uh, that has been growing a lot uh, lately. Uh, very good. And uh, there is, I mean, it's an AI, I would say, because it's a computer system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you, have, you write the rules and they are written in stone so you have to follow the rules and when one company uh, disappears like newcrest uh, and it was in the portfolio we have to add a new one and uh, so and that doesn't happen during that happens during the rebalancing phase uh, and we have a what we call a smart rebalancing or asian rebalancing so we rebalance uh, over four days so we actually buy Tell and buy, uh, and, but that's automatically. We cannot do anything about that. It's not like it. It's an, a, not an active fund. It's an ETF, so that's easy. We, <laughs> it doesn't matter what what we think. It, it just happens. We, we have to put in a new holding because we want to have twenty five holdings equal weighted uh, to be a, in a better uh, have a better fund construction for returns than the big ones in the ETF market. Uh, and I think equal weighting is much better than market weighted in that situation. Uh, 
uh, or any situation in, in the coming uh, secular bull market. So, so who replaced Newcrest in the fund, Eric? Uh, well, it's hard to say actually because we had two additions and two uh, deletions, uh, and because we rate, we want to have the companies with the also good ESG risk scores that they are doing miners and to exclude the bad miners, and uh, so the new companies actually was very very funny because Barrick or not funny, but Barrick was not one of the twenty five best companies regarding of ESG, uh, but now they are in the our ETF at four percent, but still that's much lower than the other ETFs having Barrick, uh, and also. Majestic uh, are one of the 25 best ESG ranked companies now in the world. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Don't want to jump down that rabbit hole, but uh, it's an interesting tidbit. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, You you mentioned uh, you've seen inflows into the funds, and it's one comment I wrote down as well, because I think you posted about it on on X as well. So I'm curious, um, where is the money coming from, Eric? And uh, like who who are the investors? Like I don't want any names, but I'm just more interested in the profile because, as you said before, like there's a bit of general lag of interest still with the generalists. Uh, yes, I mean we have uh, in our actively managed funds in, in the Nordics and uh, north of Europe, we have uh, forty thousand retail investors, so we have a big base uh, for that already. And, but also with our ETF, we have. Uh, I mean we are available all over Europe on all the big exchanges, so so that's good. Uh, and also that we have seen this big that's uh, that's really really nice to see institutions pension institutions buying into the story of uh, owning gold miners and of course they are happy with the construction on the ETF that it's smart that it's uh, regarding the equal weighting and questions so they don't own the bad ones that you get in a market weighted or ETF where you get all companies. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's rare that you see pension funds coming back into the market, especially in North America. Pension funds have left the gold mining space or the mining space in general. Yeah, well, now we're talking about Europe, right? <laughs> now it's <laughs> I know. So that's why it's <laughs> so, like, I'm, I'm surprised. It's great yeah. to hear. So yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if you, the problem maybe with the, some institution investors is that, I mean, it, they have a political risk. They don't want to make mistakes. They, they want to keep their job. And then it's very easy to do what everybody else is doing because then you never do anything wrong. But if you start to look where is the opportunity in the market, I mean, where can you buy something very, very cheap with, I mean, it's a volatile market, of course, but still, I mean, downside is limited, I would say, but the upside is you have a very good return situation to go for the miners. And uh, one day we will see the rotation. I mean, we see big risk with this very few companies being such a big part of, of the, all the, the other indexes. So I think, uh, but you have, of course, you have to be very strong asset managers to start to buy into gold miners as if you're a pension fund, because you're doing something different. Uh, and of course, many of them may not want to take that risk because they want to have the same return like everybody else. And then you better follow everybody else. One day they will start to think, and I think these uh, there will be winners uh, with the asset opportunity. They will get back to this real investment style and not just following. That's not making any mistakes, but that they start to trust themselves and, and do a real good job and buying cheap. Uh, I think that's uh, good. We have to wait for it, but it's good to see that it starts to happen. Absolutely, no. It's it's been a massive lack in the or missing in the sector as well because it's a bit big contributor, of course, of capital. Um, Eric, one very last question to, to sort of I wouldn't say sum up the conversation, but uh, to maybe taking it completely off topic here. Um, is uranium a green metal for you? We just jumped over hundred dollars a pound. Uranium. Uh, I, I was so lucky, actually. <laughs> I mean, it was not very easy year two thousand twenty three, but. Uh, the media, they asked like 15 managers in Sweden they had to choose one company for 2023. And on average, of course, we we were on the minus side, but for that uh, like a media competition, I chose one company in our essential metals fund, where it's a broad metal fund, and I chose Cameco. Uh, so that was my bet for 2023 in this uh, competition between uh, asset managers. 
and it, it gave me a good place with almost 100. Uh, yes, we have one fund where we invest in uh, uranium companies. Uh, I, one way I like the story, and there is a risk in the story, and uh, that is like if we would have a, a total, I mean, we see all the, everybody wants more nuclear or it, it has a good run now for more nuclear plants, and, uh, but there is a big risk. And that is like, would we have the accident in Ukraine? Uh, I mean, one day or one hour or one minute, it, it would like, uh, so it's a, you have a big binary risk if something happens there. Uh, I think like a dead dead thing suddenly. So it's, uh, and we see it's very, very expensive to start these new plants. We see that in Sweden where they're going to start new plants and so on. But it takes time and there is not enough people because you have to be very well trained to run these things so but i think it's very interesting i would have liked to see thorium uh, reactors uh, much earlier also and i think germany should uh, go for that but if they don't want uranium they should go for thorium reactors that cannot uh, have these accidents so money for it so, so i think that would be good then of course it's very difficult to invest in these uh, companies because for us, they are not liquid enough, they're not tradable. I mean, you have Cameco, and you can think whatever you want about Cameco, but uh, I mean, uh, the coming companies are maybe some interesting explorers, next gen or something like that. But, uh, and yet then you see an ETF on, on uranium companies, and I don't understand how it really works. I mean, it's buying maybe five works. companies in it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's war, but uh, I mean, and uh, I don't, I mean, they are not, we don't see them as tradable on the stock exchange. and. There is a trouble if there will be a downturn, if it's not just going up in a straight line, uh, when people start to sell in these ETFs and you have underlying companies that are very illiquid. I think that can become a problem in that market. Uh, and I would like to see more, more companies that you can really trade. Uh, that would be interesting. Absolutely. I'm headed to Vancouver uh, actually later this week for the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. Now that we're talking, I'm curious how many uranium exploration companies will be there uh, that haven't existed. Yeah, I, I would like to add. I, I would like to add one into our our essential metals fund, but uh, I need it to be tradable. I mean, there are some that are tradable, but still they are explorers. So you don't really know is the story how how good is the story I mean, in, in reality. When you start to make money. I, I would prefer if they made some money as well. But... Absolutely. Fantastic. Very, very interesting. Eric, wonderful conversation. Let, let, let's wrap it up here. You said 2475 for gold, 35 for silver by the end of the year. Um, where can we find more of your work, Eric? I think I've I, I shown the, uh, the website. Uh, where can we follow you? Ah, yeah, you got the website there. You can also follow us, get our monthly letters uh, in English if you want that. So sign up for that. Fantastic. Absolutely. No, we'll do that. And Eric, thanks so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, can't wait to have you back and uh, stay on for a second. Uh, I, I got to ask you something. So stay yeah. on for a second. Um, everybody else, really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Soar Financially. If you haven't done so, here's a reminder. Subscribe and like this video. Highly appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us. We're over 26,000 subscribers. It means a lot to me. Uh, it means that we can bring guests like Eric on this channel. We'll have other, other great guests joining us this week. Peter Schiff, Gary Wagner of thegoldforecast.com as well. So make sure to subscribe and like, and maybe hit that bell icon as well so you get a notification when we publish a new video. As I mentioned, I'm off to Vancouver later this week. Uh, I'm going to present at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I just sent in my title for the presentation, Mining 101, Capitalizing on the Gold's New All-Time High. But let's discuss that. And I hope to see some of you in Vancouver next week as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Subscribe and like. We'll be back with lots, lots more.